the workers who are looking for Carfax are now taking some of the wooden boxes of dirt out of the house and Renfield attacks them. And I just like to imagine that these guys are named Brad and Chad. Vampire Lucy goes still and it's clear that they have succeeded. And the Harkers put together that Renfield's antics line up with and give some kind of insight into Dracula's whereabouts and the Horfers finally succeed in their organizing and have put everything in chronological order. Everyone then gathers together in a conference room and it is the first time all of our main characters have been together in the same room. They tell Mina that she's out of the loop from now on and she's not happy with it. He says he wants to go right now and of course Seward doesn't give in but Redfield calls after them as they walk away you will I trust Dr. Seward do me the justice to bear in mind later on that I did what I could to convince you tonight hello world welcome back to my Dracula vlogs we are on installment seven that means there's only two more after this we are coming down to the end here things are picking up we're getting to the end we're almost in the final stages of the novel. Our last installment saw our characters finally coming together for the first time, pooling all of their knowledge and forming a plan of attack to take down our titular foe. We'll see how they use that knowledge. Spoiler alert, they don't. In today's installment, it's a doozy. Big stuff happens. Before we get into this, this chapter deals with two different characters being attacked. In the past, things had kind of been hinted at. This chapter actually sees some violence occur. You read the aftermath of one attack, but then you see another like attack in progress. So it, it's just, it's a lot, it's a bit heavy. So just a warning that it gets a bit intense here. I, I'm not gonna be very explicit with it. If you don't like hearing about people get attacked, this is maybe not the video. Maybe not the book either for you. Just a just a heads up. There's a chill in the air. I got my candy corns, apple and cinnamon candle going. I'm feeling peak vault. I'm feeling a lot. I'm thinking a lot. So let's get right into it. So chapter 19 picks up immediately where chapter 18 left off with Seward and co leaving Renfield cell. Van Helsing wonders aloud if they did the right thing with leaving him in there. All the guys feeling a little uneasy just because Renfield did seem very sane and rational. And also they know that he's tied to Dracula so it's just a complicated situation. Which you get. I went through this enough in the last video and feel like there should be more of a plan of action discussed here. But there isn't unfortunately and they just resume their mission. Van Helsing prepares them all for going into Dracula's new crib. He gives them garlic and some holy items, um, the host and crucifixes, etc. Only the best accessories for vampire hunting. And then Van Helsing, Arthur, Quincy, Seward, and Harker all venture into Carfax. They go into the house and they creep around. It is very strange spooky and creepy, dark and dusty, very old looking. They make their way to the chapel, which I'm not sure why Dracula and his Roma castle in Romania, he slept in the chapel. And now in this one, he has his bo he stores his boxes in this chapel. For somebody who dis who is like against everything holy, I don't know if it's supposed to be like a taking a place that's meant to be holy and degrading it type situation you would think he just wouldn't want to be in there i'm not really sure what his uh interior design intentions were there it's just something ironic and the men discover that out of the 50 boxes that dracula had brought over only 29 are in carfax now for those of you who are like me and we're english majors doing the math that's 21 boxes are missing <laughs> at one spooky point both arthur and harker think that they see dracula watching them from somewhere out somewhere in the room and jonathan is certain he says that he can see his pale face and his red eyes but then like he looks again and he's gone 
and Arthur had also said he had seen him. They check it out and Harper describes it as not being enough space for him to hide, but we've seen that he can, you know, vampires can move in the moonlight and in the darkness and the fog, so I don't know why they're counting it out as he can't possibly be in there. Uh, then the men see what they describe as a dark phosphorescence and then all of a sudden this swarm of rats surrounds them and they understandably freak out i guess these guys have never been to new york arthur did something absolutely incredible astounding he takes out a whistle that he brought with them opens the door blows the whistle and a swarm of dogs terriers to be specific enter the room and start chasing away and attacking all the rats and then when the dogs are done with their attack, he just opens the door again and chews them all back out. Where did these dogs come from? Where do they go? I had no idea. They're like freaking cotton eye Joes. I... <laughs> and they're terriers. Adorable. But when I think vicious guard dog, terrier is not the first thing that comes to my mind. Anybody who ever tells me I shouldn't be laughing at this book or this book is not like horror comedy, I'm going to give them the terrier attack scene. Knowing that they can't really do much more in the house, that it's almost morning, so they're like, well, our work here is done for now, and they go back next door to the hospital. Jonathan gets back to his room, Nina is sleeping, and he remarks that she looks paler than usual, and then she sleeps all day the next day, and he's like, oh man, she just must be under so much stress. The next day, Dr. Seward talks with Van Helsing about Renfield and his condition. Van Helsing goes to visit Renfield, who now has had again another change of behavior, because instead of being in awe of him, he doesn't really want anything to do with Van Helsing now, and seems very unimpressed. We then read into Nina's journal. She finds it very strange to be kept out of the loop, and just describes how sad she is. Her and Jonathan have always been confidants and have been able to tell each other everything, so the fact that there is now something that she doesn't know, especially something so big, is just really upsetting for her. And I completely understand. I would be really upset too. She also then talks about how she still feels guilty about poor Lucy's death. You know, she kind of thinks things through and is like, if I had never gone to Whippy, then maybe none of this would have happened because she was the one who liked to sit out over the cliff and she was the one who showed that area to Lucy and so she's like well if I had never gone there if I had never taken Lucy to the cliff then maybe she never would have slept walked there and and got attacked and it's just clear that Mina's dealing with just a lot of stuff on her mind understandably and it's just you know this guilt and this trauma and I just feel so bad for her and then she describes how she had trouble sleeping the night before she was wide awake after the men left to go into Carfax. She heard the dogs barking and was like, what is going on? And it's another thing where I don't really understand their whole logic of keeping her out of the loop because she still knows everything that's going on. Even if she doesn't, like, not knowing the specifics of what they're doing or maybe where they are or how big, what the problems are. Like, that worry and that anxiety has got to be even more stressful even more stressful for her to deal with than if she just knew everything, right? Like, what, isn't it better to, like, be kept in the loop? Like, it would be one thing if she didn't know anything, complete ignorance, but she knows just enough to, like, be paranoid. And again, justified paranoia. I, I just don't understand this plan at all. She then looks out the window and sees a really dense, heavy fog sneaking across the lawn and then up the building. And Mina gets very afraid, so she just like climbs back into bed and hides under the covers. Now it should be noted that her window is locked at this time. She then recalls a dream she had that seemed very real, where she woke up at some point in the middle of the night and the room was very dim and the fog had been able to get into the room. The room is just full of fog and she feels too tired to move and then she like basically passes out again or falls back asleep. Now key things that she describes here is one, she compares the shifting of the fog and everything to what Jonathan experienced in the castle when he saw the moonlight shift. Number one, 
Number two, right before she passes out, she sees two red eyes. Again, she connects it explicitly to Jonathan and Lucy's descriptions of the count. But she all thinks in her mind that this is just a dream. Why the hell would... <laughs> Nina has been so smart in this book. I mean, I've talked enough about how smart she is, but even now, this is like frustrated me because why why would you just assume it was a dream like especially seeing what lucy went through lucy thought it was all a dream you know now that it wasn't why what how and this is only the beginning this is only the beginning but it's like all of a sudden i i just don't understand i mean i would i would, if i stubbed my toe i'd be like dracula like every every my first thought for anything would be is it dracula like you have to be on your guard and she has been on her guard so why all of a sudden she's not now i don't know i don't understand especially he's right next door right next door it's not like he's miles away he's right next door she dismisses it all as a dream and she doesn't want to tell anybody because she doesn't want to worry them and again this is where their whole like oh we need to protect her thing backfires because now she's worried about worrying them because they have shown to be so protective over her so she's like oh well i just won't say anything and that's that's just everybody screwing up like why why you're what happened to everybody telling everybody everything where did it go what happened what happened to like the last two chapters it's like the chapter changed and everyone's minds are just erased i until she's very tired and then she just puts it up to not having a good sleep Renfield asks to see her and she goes to visit him but she doesn't really write down what they talk about except that he's very nice to her. At dinner that night she can tell that the men want to include her and feel bad for not sharing what happened with her but still they go along and go into a separate room after dinner to have their discussions and then she decides that she'll get to get a sleeping aid from Dr. Seward so that way she doesn't have any sleeping problems that night. And that brings us to the end of a very frustrating chapter 19. Oh, but wait, there's more frustration. Now we're in chapter 20, and now we're reading Jonathan Harker's journal. This is now the morning right after the uh, Carfax excursion. So again, he notices when Mia finally wakes up, she's tired and she's very pale. And it's like, mind you guys of anything that happened recently? Anyone? No? Okay, fine. We'll see how this goes for you. Where he's describing his investigations into the boxes. He goes to see the two carriers that had that been attacked by Renfield, Brad and Chad, and one of them, let's just say Brad, didn't remember much from that night, but he gives him the Jonathan the information to go see Chad. Chad then provides Jonathan with the some of the different locations of the boxes that they had distributed, and it seems that the boxes have been dispersed throughout London. That was the goal. After getting the addresses, it does look like they are mainly on the east side, but Jonathan presumes that the goal is for them to be all over. Chad is also just very helpful and gives Jonathan some information on another lead. There was another man that he knew that had been talking about a job that sounded similar, and so he's like, oh, this guy might know some more, and he's going to get in touch with him about that. Jonathan gets the address of the new guy, Sam, from Chad, and tracks him down. And Sam tells him that he took nine boxes from Carfax. Brad and Chad had each other to help. Jonathan asked Sam, like, who helped you? Sam says that there was a very old, creepy-looking man who helped him load the boxes at Carfax. Jonathan says, well, okay. He knows who it is, but then who helped you unload the boxes when you got to the new location? Oh, it was the same creepy old man. And Sam just says, he must have just started off after me and took a different route and been faster and got there somehow. You know, these crazy GPSs always say a different way. This man, Dracula, also opened all of the doors, so unfortunately Sam doesn't have a key or any way to get in. He also doesn't remember the house number, but he gives a very specific description of the house. He grabs the door and the house and the area that it's in. Jonathan miraculously just wanders around in that area, winds up finding that door. I guess London is tiny. He looks around the building a little bit, realizes he's not going to be able to get into it, and then decides to go to basically the real estate agent's office that sold the house to Dracula. And now, I don't know why he thought this would work out, but he tries to get them to give him information on the new owner of the house. And 
they won't give it to them, duh, to like prove confidential with our client's information. But Jonathan's got a little ace with his sleeve and it's like, oh, well actually I'm on a mission from Lord Godalming. And of course that's like the magic words. And all of a sudden the guy becomes very, very nice and he's like, oh, of course we have to help a Lord. I'll get you all the information you need. I'll follow up with Lord Godalming himself later on today. John's like, perfect. It's good to have friends in high places. Back at the house, he sees that Mina is still tired and pale and just chalks it up to her being very worried and very sad about being included. After dinner, like Mina described, the men go into a side room and Jonathan fills everybody in on his investigations and what he found out about the boxes and they get excited and full of hope because they have a lead and then hopefully they'll just be able to go there, destroy any remaining boxes, and then this all will be over very soon. Quincy also asks how they are going to break into this new house. See, you know, Carfax is kind of isolated and big open area. They have the protection of the hospital right next door. It was easier for them to break in, but this is like a house right in the middle of busy London. Breaking in is not going to be super easy. And so they're like, okay, that's like the next thing to think about. Now we see Seward's perspective of the day as Harper was on his hunt and his investigation. Uh, Seward went down to talk with Renfield, who claimed that he is no longer interested in consuming life. They also discuss souls and Seward keeps bringing it up because it seems to upset Renfield and he's trying to figure that out. Renfield just doesn't seem to like the idea of souls or being burdened with the soul or having then the creatures whose life he's consumed having a soul like that seems to upset him. And he's also confident that some new opportunity is going to come to him. He's going to ascend in some way, like something along those lines. Like it's all very like strange and vague and Seward is trying to figure it out. And then in the timeline, it's after Harper's meeting with the realtor because we now see the realtor's telegram to Arthur. In the note, they write that the house was bought by a Count DeVille. Oh me, oh my. And Dracula is in his Cruella era. <laughs> so clever, DeVille. This, a small little detail as Seward's doing his Around for the night, he talks to one of the guards, and the guard winds up mentioning that he had accidentally dosed off during the night, and so it's like, ugh, can't get good help. As chapter 20 comes to an end, all of the men are just preparing for their next mission, but just to sterilize the rest of the boxes. Arthur and Quincy are preparing the horses. Harper is out, again, following up on the house. And Van Helsing is at the London Museum doing research into occult things. Everyone is out and about. They're getting ready. They're gonna bring this to an end. And then Seward is called to Renfield so for an emergency. Buckle up, cause this is, this is about to be a lot. Seward dashes to Renfield's room, gets there as fast as he can. He finds Renfield on the ground, battered, bruised, broken bones, in a pool of blood. Now the attendants that are already there are just baffled because they don't know how this could have happened, how he could have possibly did it to himself because both his face is very bruised and his back is also broken. And they're like, if he broke his back and paralyzed himself, he couldn't have beaten his face. If he'd beaten his face, then he probably wouldn't have been in the position to break his back. It's just, they're baffled. Seward obviously knows more. And so he calls for Van Helsing. Now this is in the middle of the night. Everybody is kind of in their rooms and sleeping at this point. So he has to wait Van Helsing out. Van Helsing arrives, they send the attendants away. It's just him and Seward. And Van Helsing comes to the, cl the conclusion that they're gonna have to operate right then and there on his brain. Now, they know what's going on. They, they know Renfield didn't do this himself. Arthur and Quincy both awaken, they hear all the commotion and they get there as well. So now they're all there. So then Van Helsing says they have to wait a little bit until he can operate. I, I guess they're trying to see like if he, if Renfield is gonna wake up or if he's just like passed out, passed out. But then, so they're all just like sitting there waiting. And now why, why are they all just sitting there? All sitting in the room. Only Van Helsing needs to be there to monitor him. Everybody else should be like, go time. You know, he just got attacked. You know that he just got attacked by Dracula. You don't know where Dracula is. Is he still there? Is he not? 
we don't know why is seward not going to his co-workers and just being like hey everybody like get into your rooms we don't know what's going on like emergency lockdown situation why arthur and quincy are going to the harkers and Elliot again they don't want to include me at least tell jonathan like say like hey we have an emergency this is something we all need to be aware of we could all be under threat right now someone out there is named maria count me in because my patience is at an all-time low i just do not understand they spent all this time typing up all of the journals, the letters, the articles, reading through all of the journals, the letters, the articles. Everybody knows everything. Why everybody is now just, has just forgotten everything that they've learned. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, this was wasting precious time. That being said, why haven't they put garlic and crucifixes and just all around the hospital like you know that Renfield already has this connection to Dracula why were there not why didn't you put the host paste at his window why were actions not taken why were precautions not taken what happened to Van Helsing who saw Lucy once and was like I know what's going on and I'm gonna try to fix it like what happened what happened I feel like I'm at the beginning of the book again I feel like everybody's mind just got wiped and it didn't there's no explanation. I don't want to keep harping on this. I'm just so frustrated. Like, I'm so angry. I finished reading this chapter last night and I'm just so angry. It's just fresh in my mind. I'm anger. Alright. Let's just, let's just keep going. That's all we can do, right? That's all we can do. Exciting enough time has passed. Van Helsing operates. And then after the operation, Renfield wakes up. Great for him. But he is fading and he recognizes that he is dying. He then explains everything that has happened from his perspective and he goes back to the night that they went to go to Carfax and he had begged Seward to let him out and he tells them that the reason he couldn't tell them why he needed to go was he was tongue-tied and he did tell them that night that his master was controlling him but I guess he couldn't give any more information than that and then sure enough later that exact night while the men were at Carfax Dracula visited his window in the form of fog, he summoned some more rats over to the window and promised Renfield, like, all, basically, like, you see all these rats, all this life will be yours. Weird flex, but okay. But Renfield is enticed and he invites Dracula in, which is, of course, now Dracula can't enter a building without being invited in so now he finally has that point of entry he does mention that after allowing him in he doesn't hear from dracula for the rest of the day and so he's a little tipped by that that there's no other like promises fulfilled or anything he just gets ignored then he mentions that mina visited him and that she was pale and everyone is like Excuse me? One thing is keeping Mina out of the loop, another thing is ignoring her entirely, which it seems like everybody has done. Because <laughs> nobody's- nobody else but Jonathan noticed her being pale. I mean, they all had dinner together. <sighs> I don't- I don't know. And then Renfield says, seeing Mina pale and just lethargic made him very mad because even he knows! He knows! That means that Dracula was taking her life force and drinking her blood and that made him mad because he Mina is nice to him and he likes her and of course now everyone in the room who's again Van Helsing, Seward, Quincy and Arthur are now absolutely throttled by this. This is such big information, uh, just a revelation that not only was Dracula in the hospital but he's actually attacked Mina and none of them knew. None of them realized. Did the circus come to London? Because all I see are clowns and now Coming to that current night, Dracula appeared again, not wanting him to go after Mina. Renfield tried to attack him, didn't stand a chance, and Dracula did the bashing around. And now, I was Renfield. I know he's like dying and everything right now, but my gosh, I would struggle with everything I had in me. My last dying words would be, I told you so. Are you happy, Seward? Are you happy with your with your plans? Are you happy with your decisions, with your life choices? Not listening to Redfield, leaving him in here, not taking proper precautions. Because again, if he had just moved him to a different hospital, nobody would have invited Dracula into the hospital. Or, 
on the flip side of that, if you kept him in the cell and just made sure that you all were moved out, would have gotten Amino. But no, no. You all had to be act like you were so much smarter than everybody else with your own bunch of freaking dumbasses. Why you were even going to Carfax in the middle of the night when you knew Dracula was powerful? Why no, not one? Jonathan could sit, could have stayed behind with Amino, right? Somebody, somebody, anybody? You didn't all have to go, but no, no. And now this is what you get. Am I rooting for Dracula at this point? No, because he's messing with Mina. But, and I have her back. Am I rooting for them? I'm rooting for Mina. I can't say I'm rooting for the rest of them. Terrible. I am both angry and disappointed. <laughs> Especially Van Helsing. He should have known better. He should have known better. I mean, they all should have known better. They just went through this. So now that they've gotten the full story from Renfield, and it's been confirmed that Dracula did this to him. Now they're like, oh yeah, maybe we should get on that. And they go on the hunt, they get their weapons, their garlic and their crucifixes again. And then they get to the Harker's room. And when they get there, they're like, oh, we need to go in to make sure they're okay. Seward is hesitant because he's like, mm, isn't it rude to barge into their room? Like, dude, what do you mean? This one has broken me. This chapter has broken me. Rude. You're going in there to save their lives. Why? Just kick down the door. I am so dumb. What are you gonna do, Sword? Knock, knock, knock. Um, Dracula, is it okay if we come in? How did you become a doctor? Who gave you a medical license? How did you pass? I. <laughs> Van Helsing shuts that down. And they're like, just get in there. And so they kick down the door. They burst into the room and they come upon an absolutely horrific scene. Not gonna go into all the details to keep this safe for the tube, but I think I can give a good enough picture. Basically, if when they come into the room, they find Dracula's in there, he's holding Mina, and he's making her drink his blood. Parker is in there as well, he's still asleep on the bed. <laughs> no, he's not, he's like in his stupor, he can't, under Dracula's powers, he can't move, but... I wouldn't be surprised if he was just sleeping and didn't wake up through all the noise. So the guys advance, they have their crucifixes out, and they're like... Dracula backs away, and after a few moments of standoff, Dracula just flees into the night. And then absolute chaos <laughs> happens. Mina starts screaming. Arthur and Quincy leave the room. Van Helsing starts flicking. Jonathan in the face with a towel to wake him up. Seward is standing there and horror doesn't know what to do. Looks out the window. Quincy is down there sneaking around through the trees. Why is this man always outside on the lawn doing something crazy? Mina starts sobbing. Finally, Jonathan like snaps out of it. He wakes up and he embraces Mina. He, he begs Van Helsing to tell him what to do, how they can help her. He wants to go out right then and there and hunt down Dracula, but Mina begs him to stay. She can't handle worrying about him and just wants him with her. It's then also that she realizes that she has been bitten. She's got marks on her neck. Then she gets very afraid. She like tries to back off from him because she's worried about herself uh, and what she could be potentially capable of, capable of now um, and sees herself as unclean, doesn't want to be near it. Jonathan, but he won't hear of it and he just hugs her again and like as rough as this scene is That was nice to read that he wasn't like afraid of her or anything like he basically like no matter what Nothing's gonna come between us. And so that was very nice. Arthur and Quincy come back to the room with news Arthur hesitates and Spoon Helsing is just like at this point. Why, why are we gonna keep secrets? And I'm like yeah, Abe, why, why were you keeping secrets at all? Like, look, look, look what happened. So he's just like, no secrets between us. We're not going to conceal anything from each other anymore. A little late for that, but fine. Arthur tells them that he went to the study to look at the journals and the recordings and everything, and Dracula has burned them all. He also tells them that he went to Renfield's cell, and Renfield is now dead. R.I.P. Quincy's account is that he ran out to try and see if he could spot where Dracula was going. He saw a bat flying westward, but nothing else. Van Helsing then asked Mina to share her account of what happened. And so she was 
again, having trouble sleeping. She had taken the medicine, but it wasn't really working well. She saw the mist, and at this point she's like, oh, I saw it again. I'm not sure if I told you. And so again, just confirmation, don't keep stuff from each other. I don't know why Mina wouldn't, again, give them a heads up, give them a warning why she wasn't on guard. I went through this before. I just, I don't know. And I get her not wanting to share information with them because she doesn't want them to worry about her. Everybody should have been kept in the loop on all things. They never tried to should have shut her out. And it's just frustrating. Like, it's very frustrating. It was frustrating before this happened, and now it's frustrating that this it had to come to this. She tried to wake Jonathan, but couldn't. And then I get the mist, so, like, sneaked into the room. It became Dracula, and he told her that if she screamed or tried to call for help, he would off Jonathan right there there and then in front of her so that he drinks her blood and he also mentioned it's not the first or even the second time obviously the other night when they went to carfax it happened i think there was another night so i'm assuming it's the third like he's done it three nights in a row i'm just not sure why like one thing was why they weren't picking up on her being pale and lethargic i don't know if he's drank her blood why she never noticed any marks on her that i don't understand that's the only thing that confuses me at this point Anyway, then he goes into this like long rant about how he's pissed off because everyone's been hunting him. Like y'all have been on my ass and it's very frustrating. Whole rant about how she tried to outsmart him, about how the other guys had been like attacking him and messing with his plans. You wanna mess with the bull, you're gonna get the horns. You wanna mess with me, like I am Dracula, I am super powerful and have lived so long. Blah, 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 blah. now you're gonna be punished for it and so that's when he makes her drink his blood because that now connects the two of them even stronger than just like a regular vampire i guess and it, like condemns her soul even more i imagine and basically his goal is then to use her against the rest of them and then everyone came in and we know what happened with the rest and it's very horrific and traumatic poor mina just absolutely did not deserve that and i'm pissed on her behalf and then this chapter ends on a very dour note. Everyone's just sad and upset and at a loss because now they don't know what to do. And they all just feel very bad about themselves. I'm like, you should, you should feel bad. You should feel bad. Look what happened to Mina. Look what you did. <laughs> and yes, Dracula's the villain. He's the main problem, but come on. They all dropped the ball and poor Mina had to suffer for it. And that brings us to the end of today's installment. And now uh, they gotta go forward. We got two installments left. Who knows what obstacles they're gonna face with this connection that Mina has to the Count. How that's gonna be used against them. They still gotta find these boxes. And in just three chapters, it went from the highest high of the novel, basically, since the beginning before everything obviously went to crap. But <laughs> everyone together, Everyone teaming up, finally sharing that information, feeling like they're ahead of the game for the first time, and might actually have a chance. And Dracula's a tricky one. He came out on top this round, and like the frustrating part is, it's not just, it was only Dracula being cunning. It was also just them. I think they just got a little too big in their britches, so to speak. A little too com overconfident. But they were so knowledgeable. Oh, we're such cool guys. We're gonna be the heroes. Mina doesn't have to deal with this. We will be big, strong men and solve these problems and you made it worse. So congrats. Good job, fellas. Now we will see where this goes in the next one. I will see you next time where hopefully I will be in a better mood. Bye.